I have a cookbook for you today. I'm going to be baking with you and sharing a recipe from Don's side of the family, my husband Don, that his mother actually passed on to me when we got married and I took over baking this special bread for Easter that they've enjoyed in their family for many years. Now the recipe is Slovakian and it originally comes from my mother-in-law's aunt's mother. So what that makes her to me, I don't know. Uh, but that's the uh, history of the recipe and the it's called Pasca bread. And this is the finished product. Mine got a little toasty on top, but it's perfect on the inside. And it is a really delicious um, doughy, yeast-based doughy bread, very rich and dense. It's got raisins in it. It's got the cross on the top. Um, it's just an Easter tradition in the family and something I really enjoy making every year. Uh, so I'm going to go through this step by step with you. And if you'd like to see how I make this, keep watching. For this recipe, you will need four cups of milk. I use whole milk. A half a cup of granulated sugar. Two packages of active dry yeast. Two and a half sticks of salted butter, four eggs, one teaspoon of salt, I use kosher salt, ten cups of bread flour, and one plus cups of golden raisins. The first thing we want to do is scald our milk. So the recipe calls for four cups of milk total. I use whole milk, I just feel like it makes it for a richer bread. Um, and one quart is four cups, so I just bought a quart, so I'd have exactly the right amount. I don't even need to measure it. And then I'm pouring this into my pan. The recipe calls for scalded milk, and what that is, it's milk heated up to just before boiling, and it breaks down the proteins, and it kills the enzymes, and it basically just makes for a lighter um, yeast bread. So just it makes the, the bread come out a little bit lighter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the stove on to medium heat, no hotter than that. And we're just gonna heat it up slowly until um, bubbles kind of form around the outside and it starts to wisp. And you wanna stir this pretty frequently um, to make sure that you don't uh, form a film on the bottom of the pan or the top of the pan. Um, and again, the, the point is just to make sure it doesn't come to boiling. You don't want to boil the milk, you just want to heat it up. So it's been about 15 minutes and you can see it's gotten frothy and a little bit bubbly around the edges and it's wisping. I don't know if the camera will pick that up, but basically we want it close to 180 degrees, but no hotter than that. And I'm at 179, nope, yep, time to take it off the heat. Uh, and remove it all the way off the heat. And you don't want to use the milk until it cools down to about 110 degrees. So I'm just gonna let that sit for a few minutes and cool off a little bit, because um, we don't want to burn the yeast. Um, that would make it ineffective. We just want it to be nice and warm. So I'm gonna let that sit and set up the rest of the ingredients. Okay, now that the milk has cooled enough, I can proof my yeast. And I'm doing that by taking, portioned out a quarter cup of the scalded milk, and I'm going to combine that with a tablespoon of the sugar. Now this is already pre-measured, so you're taking half a cup of sugar total uh, for the recipe and using one tablespoon of it for the proofing. Um, so I'm going to just stir that in until it dissolves. And again, I've let my milk cool down, but it's not cold. You want it a little bit warm because that will help uh, proof the yeast. So it doesn't take a long time to mix um, combined sugar with warm milk. It's pretty much already done. And then we're gonna add in two packets of active dry yeast. Uh, so I'm just going to open those up. Don't wanna lose any. And we're gonna pour those in. I'm just gonna gently combine. It's kind of impossible to get it completely incorporated without really whisking it. Um, you don't want to kill your yeast by over mixing or being too rough with it. Um, I've had a lot of experience where I've killed the yeast. <laughs> so I just kind of gently stir it all around with a little rubber spatula and incorporate it as much as I can. I'm gonna scrape down the sides here. And I'm going to let that sit for about 10 minutes and you'll know it's proofed when it has risen and kind of gotten a bit foamy. 
While the yeast is proofing, I like to prep the rest of the ingredients that need some prep work. So I beat the eggs and I melt the butter and I soak the raisins. The recipe calls for one cup of golden raisins. I generally put in a little bit more than that, maybe like one and a half cups, because I just really like the bread with more raisins in it. Uh, so I just put those, and I'll loosely measure those in a measuring cup. So that's, that's about one and a half cups, give or take. And then I just run some really hot water. And I fill my little measuring cup with that. And I let that sit until I need it for the recipe, at which point I will drain them and uh, shake off as much of the excess liquid as possible. You don't want to add water to your batter. But I just let them soak probably for about 10 minutes in the hot water. So it's been 10 minutes, and I'll just hold this up so you can see. It has definitely proofed because we went from a quarter cup to a cup. <laughs> so that is ready and I'm going to proceed with the recipe. Um, so what we do is I actually, I really recommend using a mixer. It just takes a lot of the work out of it, but you can definitely do this by hand and knead it by hand. I just like using my electric mixer with the uh, hook attachment. This is a six quart bowl. It just fits. It really would fit better in a seven quart bowl. Or if you have the standard five quart size mixer, you can mix part, most of the flour in and then do a little bit by hand at the end on a floured work surface. I'm gonna do all of it in my six quart mixer. It just fits. Um, so I'm going to mix the rest of the milk. With two sticks of butter melted. and the rest of the sugar. And it's really just to incorporate it. Once that's incorporated, I'm going to add the yeast mixture and the remaining ingredients except for the flour. Um, so I'm just gonna bring this down so it's a little easier. So we'll put our yeast friend in there, all nicely proofed. It smells yeasty. It's always a good indication that it's working. I'm just gonna add a teaspoon of salt and my nice soaked raisins. Lastly, the four beaten eggs. We're just gonna get that going. After a few moments, no, not long, I'm going to bring this down to low and I'm going to start incorporating my flour one half cup at a time. I'm doing this very slowly. Now again, if you have a smaller mixer bowl, five quart capacity, you can probably only fit eight cups in the mixer before you have to um, put the dough on a work service and knead in the remaining two cups. Uh, I've fit the 10 cups in the six quart capacity mixer before, so I'm going to do all 10 cups here. But again, I'm going to do it one half cup at a time. I'm going to make sure I count, do not lose count, and make sure you do it slowly. You want to build this slowly. up just a little flour, which it always does. It doesn't amount to much. Um, and I had to stop it a little bit to give my mixer a break because there's a lot of work for it. This is a lot of dough in there. Um, this is definitely pushing pushing the six quart mixer to the max. Um, but it is done. So what we do now is I'm going to take it out of the mixer and I'm going to put it in a large stainless steel bowl. I use stainless steel bowl because it 
um, retains heat better and we want it to be kind of a warm for the dough to rise. Okay, I've got the hook out and I'm just gonna transfer my dough in. It is an extremely heavy, dense dough, but when it's properly kneaded, it should come out pretty clean. And that's how I know when it's done kneading. The mixer just takes so much of the work out of this recipe. I'm just gonna make a little well in the dough. And I'm just going to add the remaining half stick of melted butter in. Now this is not hot, it has come down pretty much to just being warm. We don't, again, we don't want to kill the yeast. And I'm just going to kind of work that in a little bit to moisten the dough. Okay. Now you can see the amount of dough we have here. That's what we're going to start with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this in a dark and warm place to rise. And we let it rise twice. And I, I, I let it rise for several hours. What I like to do to help along with my dough rising process is I take some plastic wrap and, uh, yes, that's right, this is a really big bowl, so I need two pieces. And I just kind of lightly place that over. I'm not really like sealing it in. It's just to help retain the moisture. And then I also place a kitchen towel over that to keep the light out. So my house is very good temperature control and there's really no spot that's really warmer than any other one that I've found. So over the years I've kind of found this way to make my own little warm dark space for my um, yeast spreads to rise. So what I do is I take a couple of pretty thick heat pads and put them on top of my toaster. I set it on the lowest bake temperature, which I believe is like 125, 120, and uh, I put this bowl on top of the two heat pads with the towel over it, and that's how I let my dough rise. It doesn't kill the yeast because it's very, very low warm, uh, you know, it's not very hot. It does heat up nicely underneath there, but the two heat pads kind of help it not be directly touching the, the, you know, the bowl with the dough in it. And that's just the method I found that's worked for me. This might not work for you. Some people put them like in their laundry rooms or, I don't know, you might find a place in your house that's a little bit warmer and nice and dark. You just have to find a method that works for you personally. Um, so I'm gonna let this sit for about an hour before I check on it. Um, and then we'll see what has happened with our dough. Okay guys, it's been just over an hour, so let's have a look. I did add one more um, pot holder to the mix, by the way. I just wanted to be extra sure. You can see, whoa. It's definitely doubled, at least, which is what we're looking for. So at this point, what you want to do is punch it down. Literally. <laughs> that's what it says in the recipe, and that's literally what you want to do. Punch it down, you can see it will deflate a little bit. I usually just kind of do like that. And then I'm going to let it go for another hour or so. It will rise again and we'll be ready to put in the pan. Pans, there's three pans. So I'm just going to cover this back up. Put it back up there. Got another 52 minutes on the clock. That's probably just about right. Take my dog for a walk, come back, and it'll be ready. Okay guys, it's been another hour. The oven turned off because I had it set. And you can see it has risen. And it's not hot, it's just barely warm. It's perfect. So now it is time to divide this into our pans. So you need three eight inch round cake pans. And you don't want to grease them, totally ungreased. Clean, dry, that's all you need. And I usually remove my rings and make sure I have clean, dry hands for this because you will be handling the dough itself. So at this point, we want to divide the dough into three sections. So I'm just going to kind of bring it back down to normal size, just kind of gently holding it. What I like to do to make sure I have even dough is to actually weigh it out. Now, this is just because I'm kind of a crazy perfectionist, but you don't have to do that. 
Um, that's just what I do. But you can just kind of eyeball it. So dough comes out pretty easy. You just want to separate it. Um, first, I'm just going to get the amounts. So they're about two pounds, seven ounces each, give or take. So now I'm going to form these into actual loaves, now that they're about the same size. Oop, lost a raisin. And usually I just kind of work the dough just slightly to make it a little bit more even. But I do also want to remove a little bit from each loaf to make the cross with. So I'm just going to kind of put that on the side for now. You can see I'm just kind of getting it smooth on the top. I mean, I'm not really forming it or shaping it much. I'm just trying to kind of get an even exterior. Now that I've got them how I would like them, I've got my little extra bits that I pulled off at the beginning. And I'm going to break that into half and start rolling between my fingers to make like a round, elongated piece of dough. And this is to form a cross on the top. So I just kind of rub it in between my hands until it starts getting a little bit longer. It's going to be a little bit lumpy because it's got raisins in it. But then I just lift up a little bit from underneath and tuck the cross under. I find that if you don't tuck the ends under, they kind of bake off. Like it, it'll just, in the baking process, the cross part will kind of stick up. <laughs> and that makes it easier to burn that part too. So I just like to kind of tuck mine under the bottom of the loaf to prevent that from happening. Voila, all done. At this point, we let the loaves rest in the pan, just as they are, for 30 minutes and preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. It's been 30 minutes. You can see the loaves have risen again while resting. It's a good yeast uh, dough, keeps rising. So we are going to pop them into the oven now. Again, if the oven is set to 350 degrees Fahrenheit with the rack in the center. I just put my loaves and their pans directly onto the rack um, and then I rotate them halfway through. So I will generally put two in the back and one in the front. And in my oven, they fit just about perfectly. I set the timer for 20 minutes and at that point I rotate and check the loaves and then I rotate them again another 20 minutes later. Generally you bake for 45 to 60 minutes or until they are golden brown and have a slight hollow sound when you tap on the top of them. So it's been 20 minutes. We're gonna check on the loaves and rotate them. I'll pull this up so you can see. Wow, they've gotten tall. They've gotten really tall. So let's, um, I'm just going to gently push around to rotate and voila. Everything looks good. It's just starting to lightly brown on the top. I'm gonna set the timer for another 20 minutes and then we'll check on them again. If the tops of the loaves start to get a little like overdone looking, just take a little foil and just kind of formed it into a loaf cover. And this one loaf got really tall. So I'm just gonna that over that just to protect it. It's the last 20 minute interval. This part is the part where you kind of want to stay close because you might actually um, need to bake them less. Mine got really scorched on the top because my stupid oven hates me. <laughs> but um, I can tell they're not they're not quite done yet. I think they need about 10, 10 more minutes and then they'll be done. So I'm just going to rotate them and then Put them in for 10 minutes and we'll take them out. So sadly my bread did get just a little bit charred on the top on one loaf. And just a little bit darker than I would normally like on the other two because of an oven malfunction and a gas oven and it flared, sadly. But um, it's alright because what I usually do is I bring two loaves to Easter and we keep one at home and we'll, we'll keep the really burnt one. The other two look pretty normal to me. What you end up with is a nice golden color. The cross, you can see, has pretty much stayed down. 
Um, except for on the burnt one, it picked up a little bit, but that's okay because that's the one we're keeping. Um, so for presentation-wise, it doesn't really matter. And I've got them out on wire racks. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to carefully take the loaves out of the pans. And how I do that is I simply, using oven mitts, flip it over and lift the pan off. Comes out clean, and then we simply flip the loaf back over. Voila. Now before you store them, you want them to come all the way down to room temperature. It's going to take a couple of hours. And I like to store mine in completely airtight containers. The bed is best eaten the day it's baked, but I usually bake it the day before Easter and it's still delightful. It's also really, really good toasted with butter. Um, so I'm going to get these all out of the pans and let them cool. And then we'll slice one up and I'll show you the inside. Okay, my two prettier loaves are still cooling, so I'm just going to cut into the one that we're keeping here to eat and enjoy immediately. To show you the spread on the inside, it is just absolutely beautiful. I'm going to slice in just a little bit deeper so you can really get a sense of it. Look at that. It is light and airy but also really dense somehow. It's a very rich bread. Um, but you can just see how evenly and fluffy it baked. It's really delicious. So I think me and Don here are gonna enjoy a slice. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing how I bake this. Well, that was it. You can see it's actually pretty easy. It just is a little bit time consuming, but it doesn't have that many ingredients and the steps are pretty easy to follow. Um, especially if you've experienced working with yeast-based dough. Um, you just have to have a little patience, but uh, came out pretty well. Again, I'm a little bummed about the scorched top, but I'm not going to let that bother me. I think it still looks pretty nice and it tastes amazing. I have a coordinating blog post where I'll have this recipe written out if you guys want the step-by-step -step directions. And I'd love to see pictures or hear about it. If you give it a try, please tweet me or leave me a message on Facebook or Instagram and tag me so I can see the pictures. And um, Happy spring, happy Easter if you celebrate, and I will see you guys real soon. Thanks for watching, you guys. Take care. Bye.